Tonight's episode is sponsored by Cryptograde, the first and only monthly box subscription service for fans of cryptozoology. Visit cryptograde.com for more information and use coupon code MONSTERS88 for 10% off your first box. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I am your guide, Derek Hayes. I have a bit of an announcement for you guys. Ooh, that was spooky. You see, a lot of people don't know this, but Sarah and I are actually getting married next Saturday. And on top of that, we're having a week-long summer camp-style wedding with family from across the country. So needless to say, we've been a bit short on time. But I certainly didn't want to leave you guys hanging. So tonight, I'm putting together a grab bag episode. Now that's not the only news I have. This is the 19th episode of Season 7, which means the next episode will be the Hometown Legends season finale. But due to our upcoming wedding... I'm going to take my time off on the front end of that special episode rather than the back end. So in short, I'm on break for the next three weeks. I will return with part one of the Hometown Legends special on August 1st. Of course, Patreon will continue as scheduled. Please keep those calls coming. I have some big things in store for Season 8. But, before we get ahead of ourselves, the following was submitted anonymously from the state of Pennsylvania. Hey Derek, I'm calling from Philly. Love the show. Recent episodes have been great. Bumped into a friend over the weekend who reminded me of uh, something kind of creepy that happened probably about 20 years ago now. I was living in a suburb outside of Philly, and this friend and I were kind of getting into photography and kind of roaming at night, shooting graveyards, this and that. But there was a local church, a massive one. I guess they had like a sanctuary policy because the door to the sanctuary was always unlocked. You could waltz in any time, day or night. And we would go there every once in a while real late at night and just do night photography. I mean, the light through the stained glass and the big pillars. I mean, it was a massive, massive, massive hall, I guess you would say. The one night in particular we go there and we both just kind of kneel at the uh, front stage. They've got those pads where I don't know what people do. I'm not a churchgoer, but, uh, just kind of soaking in the silence and, you know, real gorgeous place, like I said, but him and I are kneeling there about to start taking photos and I hear something and I look back and in the darkness, maybe 20 pews behind us is just a person sitting in a shadow, probably around midnight. And I almost my pants and just start nudging Ryan with my, foot and I kind of nod my head back and he looks back and turns white but I see he's not looking where this person was sitting he's looking up at the balcony and all the way back 
there's another person sitting in a pew in the shadows in the balcony at like midnight like blood just froze we just without turning around again stood up and got the out of there really creepy i mean couldn't see any any details just that it was a person a uh, guy that i saw first guy girl whatever it was was in the shadow of a pillar kind of perfectly but you know definitely two people not together in a church sitting silently at midnight and you know it, it's an older church it was remodeled but like i don't I, I don't think anything happened there it's not it's not old enough to i don't know make me think it was i don't even know what to think but yeah thought you might enjoy it still creepy uh yeah what would you do bye Thank you, caller. I'm scratching my head here trying to figure out if this is some sort of shadow man entity or a living person that's perhaps up to no good. Now, one thing that the caller did mention was that he was in Philadelphia, and he'd also mentioned that the church isn't very old. There's one important aspect here I think we should keep in mind, and that is the history the ground holds, meaning what sat there before the church was built? Who's passed by there? Who died there? Oftentimes, people think, well, this is a new house. It shouldn't be haunted. But often, people don't take into account the fact that sometimes the ground is what's haunted. Thank you again, caller, for taking the time to share your call. So continuing on with this grab bag, our next call comes to us from the state of Washington and was submitted by Michelle. Hi, I love your podcast. I just started listening to it and honestly, I have been doing almost nothing but listening to it. Uh, every day at work while I'm doing research. So I just want to say thank you. You're great. And um, I just wanted to share my story. I have had many, many encounters with paranormal um, phenomena. And I'm talking like ghosts, spirit voices, shadow people. I've been touched. I've been spoken to. I've been woken up. I've had my bed sat on where you can actually see a butt print <laughs> um, on the bed. Um, you name it, it's happened to me. And I've even captured EVPs and other things to share with people. But I wanted to share where this all started. When I was a little girl, I lived with my grandmother for a while um, due to horrible circumstances in my own home. So um, I lived with my grandmother and she and I would sleep together on the hideaway bed in the living room next to this enormous picture window. Well, one night I woke up because I heard something outside and I saw, there's no easy way to describe this thing. It was a kind of tall, gangly looking guy and he looked almost green because the house was reflecting upon him. Uh, it was a greenhouse and in the moonlight, it reflected back on him. So he was either white or gray no facial features, uh, just extremely spindly looking. And he, st he stepped from the ground with his left foot, if I remember correctly. He picked up that foot and it stretched up to the roof and he stepped up. And, and there's, no, there, there's no reason to believe this, but, but I know what I saw. And I was terrified. I covered my head with the covers, you know, little girl. And I listened. And I could hear shuffling on the roof. He stepped right from the ground with one foot, swift motion, up to the roof, and his body followed. And it was the beginning of my paranormal experiences. I had to be about six, I'd say, from that night 
I learned that other members of my family had had uh, experiences with alien, uh, alien encounters, ghost encounters. I guess you name it, it's happened to my family. And I do believe that some people are more prone to that simply because um, phenomena or, you know, ghosts know that they can um, communicate with you. So I happen to see ghosts and weird things everywhere. I, it doesn't matter where I am, haunted or not, I see them, I feel them, I hear them. This was just where it started. This weird man that I now liken to Slender Man almost. He was in my grandparents' front yard and he stepped onto the roof. That's my story. You know, people can believe it or not. I wasn't sleeping, I was wide awake and he was there. So again, thank you for listening. My name is Michelle, and that happened on Vashon Island in Washington State. And I'm going to say around 1980-ish, maybe midnight, maybe one in the morning. But it was it was very very late, uh, very very dark, except for the moonlight, pitch black. So that's that's what happened. Thanks for listening. Bye bye. Thank you, Michelle. Now, just in case you've been living under a rock, the Slender Man is a fictional supernatural character that originated from a creepypasta internet meme created by Something Awful Forums user Eric Knudsen, also known as Victor Surge, back in 2009. Now, obviously, this encounter took place well before 2009, which brings up a handful of interesting points. Did the Slender Man somehow exist prior to his creation by this Victor Surge? Is there something else out there that maybe looks similar that may have been mistaken? And then there's always the possibility that Victor Surge himself saw something similar to what Michelle saw and was inspired to create the creature. Either way, this story is fascinating and downright creepy. And it makes me wonder if perhaps there are any Native American legends in that region that may detail such a creature. Maybe someone listening has some insight on that. Thank you again, Michelle, for sharing your story. Our next submission of the evening comes to us from Julie in Parts Unknown. Hi, this is Julie. I live in Willits now. I called a few days ago and left a message about a UFO in Portland, Oregon back in 1963. This particular story is about a ghost that is, I didn't encounter, but my uh, cousin um, did. He owned a restaurant in Moss Beach. It was actually featured on Unsolved Mysteries, which is how I encountered my cousin again. I saw him on Unsolved Mysteries and recognized his voice, and I hadn't seen him in about 20 years. He owned this Moss Beach distillery, which had a ghost. They call her the Blue Lady. My cousin was very skeptical. He didn't believe in ghosts and didn't believe that this existed. But when we went to see him, my daughter and I went for lunch over there and saw my cousin again. He said some strange things happened. One thing was that they had a programmed thermostat to heat the restaurant, and it was programmed to turn on at a certain time of the day. Nobody else knew how to use it. He came in on a Saturday, and the heat was going full blast, and he couldn't figure out how in the world that happened. Another time, he said their wine cases were kept in a sort of closet. The only way into this room was the door, which opened in. And when they came in one morning, they couldn't open the door. They had to actually find a way of taking the door off the hinge in order to get in. And there, there were about three or four cases of wine behind the door. Nobody could have put them there because the door opened in. The other thing was that some people have actually seen the blue lady. She helped a little boy who was climbing on the cliffs outside the restaurant, which is 
faces a small bay on the Pacific uh, Ocean. And this little boy was climbing the cliffs, and she appeared to him and said, you have to go back. This is dangerous. You can't be here. And when he turned around and left, he, he turned back to see if she was there, and she'd gone. So that's the story. My cousin actually brought a psychic, a fairly well-known psychic, who has since passed away. They did some research on the woman who apparently is, is haunting this facility. And she was there during Prohibition when they used to receive illegal shipments of alcohol. Uh, that's why they called it the Moss Beach Distillery. She used to come over there and spend time with the piano player. And she was married, but she she loved the piano player. And apparently, um, one night she was going home and she had a car wreck and she died. And she was wearing blue the day that she died. So apparently that's the person uh, i don't know her name but they did find it out if you look back on some of the old unsolved mystery programs you might be able to find this episode the the place has since been sold by my cousin um, he did, no longer owns it but i thought you'd be interested in that little story apparently people who go to that moss beach to really have if they're sitting at the bar sometimes they'll feel uh uh, fingers go across the back of their neck and things like that. The lights swing. and Oh, the bookkeeper at one point saw the uh, checkbook float across the room. That happened as well. So my cousin ended up a, a bona fide believer in uh, ghosts. Hope you can use this and you enjoy it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Julie. Now, as an avid lover of Unsolved Mysteries, I distinctly remember this segment. And believe it or not, I was able to find it. So I figured we'd at least play a few seconds of it to kind of see what kind of scene they painted. This is from Season 5, Episode 7 of the NBC series Unsolved Mysteries. Moss Beach is a lonely, windswept cove which lies 20 miles south of San Francisco. The Moss Beach Distillery is perched on a bluff overlooking the cove. The restaurant's name pays homage to the building's history. During the heady days of Prohibition, it was a notorious speakeasy. In recent years, all manner of strange goings-on have been reported at the Moss Beach Distillery. Waitresses swear that cold winds swirl through the dining room when no windows or doors are open. One of the former owners claims she has seen objects fly through the air and doors locked mysteriously of their own accord. At last count, as many as five different ghosts have been reported lurking in and around this restaurant. Now, I've been here all day and I haven't seen a single ghost. But over the years, a lot of other people have, or say they have. And since it's almost Halloween, the rest of us should at least try to keep an open mind According to local legend, all this ghostly business began some 70 years ago with a beautiful lady in blue. Robert Stack. His voice was just absolutely perfect for that program. Thank you again, Julie, for sharing all that information. Our next tale of the evening comes to us from John in the state of Minnesota. Hi, Derek. This is John from Minnesota. I was calling in about an experience that I had when I was little. I've been listening to the podcast for about a month and a half now. I've been binging it, and i got to try and slow down because I'm catching up to where uh, the new episodes are coming in, and I don't know how I'm going to be about waiting for a whole week before I can listen to a new episode. Anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and tell my story, I guess the best place to start is the first episode that I remember. It was the late 70s. I was about five years old, living with my mom in just a kind of a shack house, just one story, two bedrooms, bathroom, wasn't anything fancy, but the first memories that I have of, of my childhood, and unfortunately, it's also the first memory I have of 
you know, something kind of dark that's been following me through kind of my whole life. But what happened was one night, I'm guessing it was somewhere around between like midnight, two in the morning, something I was sleeping and I was having a dream. And in this dream, I was at my grandmother's house and I would walk from room to room and every time I would be walking out of the room I would look behind me and there'd be this hand disembodied hand crawling like it was crawling after me almost like thing from the Adams family um, and it was each room I'd you know get up and walk out and go to a different room and then it would I'd sit at the kitchen table and then I would pop up at the other end of the table and start crawling across the table at me and in the dream I would just move from different room to different room and it just kept following me and finally I got into my grandmother's kitchen and I looked behind me and it wasn't there I was I remember feeling relieved in my dream and then I heard a noise and looked up and it was above me and it was when I looked up it released from the ceiling and was falling down at me and it scared me so much in my dream that I jolted awake but when I jolted awake, I I opened my eyes and, and kind of gasped. But as I did that, a real hand came across my face and just gripped onto my face and, like, pushed me back into my pillow. And it scared the living hell out of me. And I was, all I could do is I looked to the side, kind of like through the fingers, and I could see, like, this dark figure with like a robe I couldn't see a face or anything like that but it's like it had my face in its hand and it was just holding me into the pillow and I just freaked out so I knocked the hand away from my face and jumped out of bed in just one quick motion and ran to the door to my bedroom and I remember when I got to the door I didn't I didn't look at the figure or anything I just I would not turn around to look at it. I just ran to my door and went to open it, and it wouldn't open, which was weird because my door didn't lock. It didn't have a lock on it. it you know, we're late 70s. It was one of those older-style houses that, you know, all the doors that did shut had, like, a skeleton key lock, but nobody ever had the skeleton key to lock the doors any ever, so, you know, they never locked. There wasn't a lock on it, but... I beat on it and, and like smashed into it with my body and everything. I could not get that door to open. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. And then I heard my mom come on the other side of the door and grab the other side and started trying to pull on it. And she thought I was pulling, so she was telling me to stop, but I wasn't. And then finally the door just opened and I turned around and looked and there was nothing behind me. And I was trying to explain to my mom that somebody was in the room and they grabbed me and you know she just said you know it's probably just your imagination or something but just remembering back on that I just it didn't it did not feel like my imagination like I know that, that something grabbed me and like held my head and my face and it just terrified me and I just kind of feel that that was the first step in kind of a uh, long sequence of strange things that's happened. But um, I'll call back another time with some other stories. But And I, I don't think it really fits into sleep paralysis because I know that I, as soon as it happened, I jumped out of Like, I wasn't frozen. I jumped out of bed and knocked that thing's hand off my face and ran to the door. So I don't think that falls into sleep paralysis, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I just thought I'd you know see what you thought about the whole experience and um I just want to tell you you know thank you for your podcast it gives people a platform that don't really have a platform to explain things that have happened to them and it's really therapeutic and you know we can't thank you enough because you know out there there's all these skeptics and you know debunkers saying that the paranormal doesn't show them anything but then you have us that you know we experience things and the paranormal shows us too much sometimes but yeah again thank you and um i'll call back 
another time. Thank you, John. It's stories like yours that make me wonder if there's another element to the sleep paralysis phenomenon. Maybe there's a second or third level to it. Now I'm thinking of calls like John's, where a while back we had one where a chimpanzee wearing overalls wandered into a child's room. And I believe we had one where a dinosaur actually walked in. So these are the kind of things I would expect children to dream of. Disembodied hands. Of course, we have the Adams Family. Chimpanzee in overalls. If you've seen an 80s cartoon, there's a chimpanzee in overalls somewhere. These are the sort of images that should be familiar in a child's mind, at least at the time the encounters took place. Now, I'm certainly not a sleep professional or anything along those lines. In fact, I barely get six hours a night myself. But I can tell you that there does seem to be something strange going on that's beyond sleep paralysis. It's almost as if this is a heightened version of of sleep paralysis that carries on even after the sufferer is awake and moving. Thank you again, John, for taking the time to share. I hope that someday soon we get to the bottom of whatever it is that's going on. I have a couple more stories to share with you, but before I do, I'd like to touch on a couple quick announcements. Don't forget, I am looking for trucker submissions. So if you drive a truck or uh, spend a ton of time on the road, experience something strange through your windshield or at a truck stop, just anything road-related, please send that call on in. I'm hoping to kick off Season 8 with this special episode, so you have at least another couple weeks to submit that. And be sure to mention that it's for the trucker episode early on in the call so that it doesn't get buried. The t-shirts came and sort of went there's only a handful of the smaller sizes and I think the larger sizes of the Brett Manning shirt remaining. But don't fret, I have a new order in place. My printer Nick assured me that we can get this turned around quite quickly. So stay tuned and I will be sure to mention to everyone when those shirts become available. And for those asking for mirrored men's shirts, those are getting ordered as soon as the wedding is over. And lastly, if you enjoy the show, you'll probably enjoy our social media accounts. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and of course Facebook. And we actually have a closed Facebook group that you can become a part of. There's all kinds of fun going on over there. And I'd like to welcome John and Sarah as our new moderators. Welcome to the team, guys. And speaking of social media, we held a little Mirrored Men art contest. And you guys certainly did not disappoint. But the artist that took home the gold, so to speak, was Addie Y. And not our Addie. This is another Addie. Uh, she actually put together a pair of custom mirrored men shoes. Sneakers, if you will. And I gotta tell you, these things are amazing. So jump on over to Facebook and I'll, I'll post a picture on Instagram as well. So that you guys can see what amazing work Addie did. But I also want to say thank you to everyone that submitted artwork. It was all simply amazing. And some of it will be hanging up here in the studio soon. Alright, on that note, let's get back to these last couple stories. And to kick off the back end of the program, our following story was submitted by Rob in the state of Michigan. Hi, I'm actually relatively new to the podcast. Yeah, my story started way back when I was about 12, 13 years old. My name's Rob, by the way, and it happened around in Michigan, southwest part, around Bangor area, Grand Junction. And as a kid, I was just always walked around everywhere because there was a countryside, and so if you needed to get anywhere, we'd always walk. Parents weren't around as much as often as I'd like them to be, but... You know, that was just my way of getting to place to place as I would walk or I would bike or I'd even hitchhike, uh, <laughs> um, get rides from other people. It's kind of um, weird. And, uh, well, anyways, one day I was uh, called my cousins and I told them, hey, um, let's meet up. And so 
they wanted me to come over to their house. And so I've done this many times and, you know, I've walked through the countryside and walked all the roads. So I already knew the routes that I should have taken to, to get there as fast as possible. And there was just like this um, on my left side, there's just like this huge opening. And then there's a far tree line um, that cuts over into a square. And, you know, I was just minding my own business. And then all of a sudden I just, I just felt like I needed to look up there and I look over on the tree line and, I just see like this white figure, didn't know really what it was, and it was pretty tall, um, I know that, but it, as soon as I turned around, it, it was like it knew I was doing that, and it wanted to just hide inside the tree line, and I couldn't see it, and so I just I just stood there, dumbfounded by this figure, and <laughs> I needless to say, I started walking a lot faster, actually I started running as fast as I could. I just felt like something was just watching me ever since then. And, and so every time I felt like I shouldn't have walked or I shouldn't have gone to a friend's house or a cousin's house, I would never go. And it stuck with me for, for quite some time. And until recently, I started thinking about it again and kind of creeped me out. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's just my story. Um, but yeah, thanks for listening. I appreciate it. Hope you guys enjoy. Thank you, Rob. We actually grew up the exact same way. During the summer, we would walk or ride our bikes at least 20 miles to go fishing. We didn't dare do any hitchhiking. There were all kinds of weirdos out there. And luckily, we never ran into the strange figure that Rob ran into. Now, I'll be honest, I would have loved some more detail as to what this creature looked like. That would at least give us an idea of which kind of white thing we might be dealing with. Thank you again, Rob, for taking the time to share. And just like that, the show nears an end. But before I play our last stories, and before I duck out of here, I want to remind you guys how you can submit stories. Simply call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's one 1- 888-608-6444 or you can visit the Report Your Sightings tab on the website at monstersamonguspodcast.com Okay, now this one I know a little bit about. The following comes to us from Anne in my state of California. Hi, um, my name is Anne and this is my mom's story. It happened in Los Angeles, California in 1960, 1961. I was just a baby, but my mom has always told this story and it's always the same. Anyway, my parents had immigrated from Europe in like 1957. So my mom was a homemaker with two little kids at the time. Um, She didn't speak very much English and she certainly didn't read or write any English. So we lived on a property that was pretty large. It was about an acre and it was in the shape of a rectangle. There was a house in the front where my aunt lived and we lived in the house towards the back of the lot. So she was doing laundry. We didn't have a clothes dryer so she would always take the clothes out and hang them out on the line. The clothes line was not like the ones they have today where they're like in a circle. This is old school so It was like two metal T's, and then the line was strung between the two metal T's. She was taking the clothes out onto the porch, and it was a sunny morning, nothing unusual. So um, she stepped out, and she had her basket of wet laundry in her hands, and the house was kind of elevated, so she had to go down these steps. And so as she's carrying the basket, she's looking down at the steps so she doesn't fall. And then once she hits the ground, she starts walking towards the clothesline. And as she's walking, she's looking at the clothesline and she suddenly stops because she sees standing underneath the clothesline is this little silver man. And she said she just stopped and was completely frozen with fear. And so she's looking at him and he starts motioning for her to come. And she says that she hears in her head that he wants her to come. 
And so she said she dropped the basket and she turned to run back in the house. And she said the next thing that she remembers is that she's in the kitchen and it's not the morning anymore. And that's all that she remembers. She doesn't remember anything else. So shortly after that, we moved to a suburb of L.A. And now it's like the 1960s, you know, UFO talk is everywhere. And so I'm telling my friends, you know, the subject comes up. So I tell my friends about the story. And when my mom finds out about it, she's not happy. And she tells me, don't tell anyone about this story. And I said, well, why not? Isn't it true? And she said, yeah, it's true. But no one's going to believe you, and I don't want people to think that I'm crazy, so don't tell anybody the story anymore. So I didn't. And then, But then later on as an adult, you know, I've always been interested in UFOs and hauntings and all that stuff. So I asked her about the story because as I'm reading all of these different tales about UFOs and such. I always thought when she told me about the little silver man, I always pictured the silver man being like an astronaut with his silver suit on. But she said, no, that's not what he looks like. When she described him again to me, I realized what she was describing was what I would think would be a gray alien. So yeah, it's a really strange story. But um, that's it. And I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed the podcast. And I think you're doing a great job. And I have other stories to tell, so I may be calling back. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you, Anne. I actually often wonder, how many amazing stories did we lose to people that were afraid to share, fearing the ridicule and the judgment? I often wonder what amazing stories we would have collected had I had this show running years ago. Now I'm certain that each decade would have its own prominent phenomenon. Perhaps stories of the satanic panic in the 1980s. Or mystery beast encounters of the 60s and 70s. And of course the aliens and flying saucers of the 1950s. Now when I started this show, over three years ago, I knew I'd receive a lot of contemporary submissions. But what I didn't realize is that I'd also get older accounts incredible stories like Anne's. And there's just something comforting about knowing that older generations experienced the same weird and strange phenomenon that we did. Thank you again, Anne, for taking the time to share that classic story. And that's going to do it for this episode. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Warren Pon Abbott, Tony Bell, and Addie Lloyd. All audio used in this production is done so under the protection of fair use. And the amazing music that you're hearing was provided by Coag. Thank you all for listening, and until next time. Just because I'm short on time doesn't mean I'm not going to hide a little something in the back for you guys. Now tonight's bonus submission was sent to us by Dylan in the state of Kentucky. Hi, I just wanted to share the story. It's Dylan from Kentucky, where my dad had experienced uh, when he was a kid. He lived in a house, I think it was a three-bedroom house, in a place called Hurricane Holler. And there, there was a lot of things that had happened in that home. But there's one story in particular that always has stayed with me, what he had told me. He said that he had an aunt come down from Ohio and to stay, stay on high with him a couple of nights to visit with him. And they decided to put her in this one room where 
it was always cold and the closet doors would never stay closed. Every time you try to close it, it would always open by itself. And it was always creepy at night. He said that one night when she came in, the first night to visit, uh, everybody went off to sleep. And she was laying there in the bed. She hasn't dozed off yet. And she said all of a sudden she looked down and there was a little baby crawling on the floor. And she started to think, you know, they didn't have any children, you know, at that young of age enough to just start crawling on the floor. So she said that was awful, you know, odd that a little child like that is walking. And she said it got closer and closer to the bed. And as soon as it got closer to the bed, it turned to a monkey. He said it, she said it jumped on top of the bed with her and looked at her and said, can I sleep under the bed? And she said, no. And she, you know, was frightened by this. And all of a sudden, he said, well, can I sleep in the same bed with you? And she said, no. Then he looked at her and again and said, can I sleep under the house? And she said, no. And he got all the way close to her face where barely she could breathe and said, can I sleep in the foundation of your soul? And all of a sudden, she, all she could say was, oh, Lord, God have mercy. And when she said that, it vanished out of thin air. Several st- instances where things that had happened there, they they got to the point where they couldn't handle it anymore. Like, doors would open by themselves. Um, they would they'd walk out. The big cabinet doors opened. Several different things. Um, it was just really bad place. To this day, if you drop down there at night, you could just feel the eerie feeling of it. But I wanted to share that story. I love the podcast. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dylan. I don't know what they put in the moonshine down that way, but the Appalachians have some awesome stories. Now, I've mentioned many times that I grew up in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains, literally the last county considered Appalachian in my section of the state. Now, although my area did share many of the aspects of the Appalachian Mountains, it certainly didn't have the deep-rooted folklore that areas such as Eastern Kentucky and West Virginia did. But luckily, we have folks like Dylan sharing these stories. So thank you again, Dylan, for taking the time to share. And thank you for sticking around to the end of the program. Have a great night.